afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome to our final press conference here of the 2019 annual meeting of the new champions. I have the great privilege of introducing a brand new report uh, written for the Senate, written by the Center for Cybersecurity, along with some very important partners. Uh, it's called Incentivizing Responsible and Secure Innovation, Principles and Guidance for Investors. So I'm joined by a very distinguished panel. I'm going to introduce them all, and then they're going to make some brief remarks. And then we're going to open it up to questions. I've got some questions I'm going to ask. There's a couple of people in the room here who probably have also some questions. Uh, cybersecurity is a very hot topic, so it should be a very informative um, 30 minutes. So we have Aloise Swingy, the head of the Center for Cybersecurity here at the World Economic Forum and a member of our managing board. We also have Michelle Zatlin, the co-founder and COO of Cloudfa Cloudflare. Sorry, Cloudflare. Thank you. Uh, and we also have David Lee, executive director of the Shenzhen Open Innovation Lab, and Haiyan Song, the SVP and GM of, uh, of security markets at Splunk. So Alois, I'm going to pass it over to you. Can you give us an introduction to the report and tell us maybe why now is the right time to write it? Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, I think why this, why now is sort of a good starting question. Um, you know, if you look at the fourth industrial revolution, that has brought us and will bring us a host of new technologies that will change our lives, that will fundamentally change our lives, but it will also change fundamentally business models of organizations and actually even it will change how societies will develop over the future. Now, um, that means that if we now move sort of most of our technological advancement into cyberspace, we we'll obviously um, have their vulnerabilities, uh, you know, through cyber attacks because like in the real world or in the physical world, we always had uh, you know, people who meant well and people who had different uh, intentions. And if we look at the last years, clearly cyber attacks have been on the rise and have uh, uh, started to affect, again, lives and companies uh, profoundly. And as a consequence thereof, obviously, the trust of people like you and me uh, started to erode or started to um, uh, get, uh, get, get challenged about new products, about new services. And so clearly what we see now is that companies have to treat cyber resilience not anymore as a technical problem or a technological issue, but it's really becoming a strategic issue, a risk management issue. It's becoming a matter of is my business, is my organization actually preparing for the future, ready for the future. Um, that means that security needs to become really uh, as the, at the, at, needs to become part of the beginning of any innovation process that I have. If I develop a new product, if I develop a new business model, I need to think now from the beginning on the aspect of security. And uh, at the World Economic Forum, we created two years ago the Center for Cybersecurity. And uh, as we have done for nearly 50 years, the forum always works with uh, the stakeholders from uh, public sector, private sector, civil society and academia to find solutions to the world's challenges. And here uh, we were asking ourselves how can we actually make a contribution to uh, increase the trust and resilience um, of innovation processes. And um, in, in that regard we're very uh, proud to launch today this uh, initiative, this report on incentivizing responsible and secure innovation. And we started uh, with thinking about as an investor, when you are an investor and if you look at um, target companies to invest in, how do you make sure that security is actually as important in that business as other areas that you have observed or looked at as an investor, be it financial, the financial aspect or the talent aspect or the governance and compliance aspect. And sort of we're arguing is as an investor, you need to do this also um, for um, targets that you have uh, uh, in, in, your, uh, in, in your site for acquisitions, for mergers um, or for IPOs. And we're very happy that we could work with 15 uh, uh, more than 15 partners on this, but also with academic partners. 
And we certainly have the hope that this might become part of a future industry standard. So maybe that's so much from our side, Amanda. Mm. Thank you, and I think bringing in the industry and bringing in entrepreneurs and experts is definitely a big part of you know, this process. So I'd like to turn to you, Michelle. Like, as an entrepreneur, can you tell us a bit more about your perspective and how that would kind of feed into something like this? Absolutely, thank you. I could not agree more, Eloise, about the, how um, online innovation technology has really transformed how, how we all interact, and it's touched every single person. And for the good, I mean, there's just been incredible opportunities created with this. However, as you mentioned, with the good, we've realized there's a lot of risk um, with, uh, with all these digital transformations. And I often find that when people start to say, oh, wow, we need to pull back, and that's the exact wrong reaction. What you really want to do is lean in, because this is not going away. And so I wanted to share a personal story. Um, nine years ago, I was a student um, at Harvard Business School, and a classmate and I were working on a school project. And I went and talked to a lot of small businesses, and I asked them, how big of a problem is cybersecurity for you? And these are the sorts of reactions we got. Um, online criminals are the scourge of the earth. Uh, web spammers uh, should be in, are criminals and should be in jail. Web spammers make me believe in the death penalty. Now, this was a very visceral reaction. You just read this and you said, wow, you don't have to be a cybersecurity expert to be like, there is a real pain point here. The next question was, okay, what are you doing to protect yourself? And there were no good solutions. They all had homegrown solutions, they felt vulnerable, alone, and that's a really isolating place to be. And this, that is the state of small businesses. They, they, they knew it was a problem, but there weren't good solutions. And so, um, as M Amanda mentioned, I'm an entrepreneur, and so actually we took that and we created a service. And, and Cloudflare, the whole reason we started Cloudflare was, can we create a cybersecurity solution that would help small businesses, entrepreneurs, developers, who didn't have the resources that the large enterprises had access to. And that was the whole catalyst for why we started Cloudflare. Now, fast forward nine years later, we have over 16 million internet properties that, that use Cloudflare. I've built a company with over 1,100 people, and I've raised over $300 million of venture uh, capital. And if I fast forward to today, you know, I've been here at the World Economic Forum this week, which has been amazing. I've been meeting entrepreneurs. And yesterday I met, I met um, an entrepreneur who's trying to bring power to a billion people around the world who don't have power. And when I met him, he said, oh my goodness, my investors are pushing me. How am I gonna secure the smart power in the homes? It's top of mind. And, and, and he was like, and I don't know how to solve that. I'm passionate about bringing power to these homes, to all these people who don't have it, but I have no idea about what to do on the cybersecurity front. Um, I met another entrepreneur who sh she's uh, bringing emotional intelligence to all the people online. She's like, a lot of, there's a lot of mental illness. I want to help get, get them help. Um, there's a lot of cyberbullying. How can I protect my users? And she's like, I care about protecting against cyberbullying, but I don't know how to do that. And so actually, as I see where we are today, the, the, it, 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 this report could not come at a better time. Having frameworks that businesses of all sizes can use is critically important. It's not just the enterprises. They've always had good solutions. They're gonna be okay. Good security is hard, but they have great solutions. But it's how do you secure all the small businesses, all the developers, all, all the entrepreneurs who are just starting out? And, and again, I think this framework is so accessible to both the small businesses all the way up to the large enterprises and having one nomenclature, one, one framework, one guiding principle is critical to helping push this conversation forward. And so I, I, I'm very encouraged. And I will just say the last point about the investor side, um, we have many investors, uh, they, when we told them that we were taking on this challenge to help small businesses with their cyber security needs, you know, it was really critical to like, you need to take this seriously, right? And so it comes back to how you design your product um, the types of people you hire. And again, it's not just the cybersecurity team within your company, it's how do you educate everybody in your company and some of these cyber culture, um, and our investors really pushed us to think about that. And again, as I met entrepreneurs here this week, I was encouraged to hear that their investors were asking them the security questions to make sure that they were secure to deliver on their promise. And so I feel like we're just at the beginning. This report comes at a great time to help set up the framework um, to help move the conversation forward and, and, and continue the global conversation. Michelle, thank you very much. Um, David, you represent a, a tech manufacturing hub, a home of innovation. Can you give us your perspective about you know, these principles in the report? 
Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, right now the, the the cybersecurity is going beyond just the attack on the cloud, attack on the website. Right now, as we have more and more connected device, intelligent device coming to our home, speaker, IP camera, uh, the attack is also can come in into the the, the system. Um, not just through the well-protected cloud, but this vulnerable system. And today, in terms of creating a new piece of intelligent hardware, uh, we have the narrative being used by the startup and the reality of how they actually happen. So every startup who creating a piece of the uh, hardware or evoking the image, uh, imagination of Stephen Jobs in the garage, doing everything from scratch. But in reality, they comes to my city center, uh, going down the street, pick up the, the cheapest one they can get, uh, with no ideas of where it's originated, who's responsible for the piece in it, who's writing the software. Uh, as all they know is the, this is the cheapest one doing the job, slap a logo on it, put it on Amazon, and now you get your IP camera. Now things starting to happen. Now we're starting to have the early days of internet, uh, common flaw coming into the system. Uh, and this small brand has no idea how to handle it because they don't write the code. They don't even have the traceability to who actually wrote the code. Uh, even if you found a company who wrote the code, it's like, well, you're just buying this from me. There's no long-term contract for me to update this, for me to fix this. Um, so we are in a mess right now in terms of the IoT investment for security. Um, so, I think moving forward, and what we work on a lot is the, we want to open this up to become more transparent, uh, both to educating the uh, investor, uh, the startup, and also the, uh, the public about how the things you put at home, which is streaming your image into some service, uh, how they are made, uh, where they come from, and the second ball is the opening up in this ecosystem. Um, it was interesting, I was sitting next to Michelle and we were talking about my early days. Uh, my first internet startup was 95. We built our own server. We don't have anyone. We had to handle all our own security. And, but today, as a, a startup uh, on the web space or on a mobile app space, I can lean on company like Cloudflare to say, okay, well, let me go deliver my value. You take care of my security. And we want to open up that kind of visibility into the device side and hopefully uh, inside investors to say, okay, well, who's the cloud player for IoT? And that is the things we are happy, really happy to see the report is bringing the focus uh, to security, to investment. Uh, and hopefully this is the, the beginning of that conversations. Thank you, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, hi, and let's turn to you. Um, can you give us a little bit more of some insights of how investors could maybe benefit from you know, using these guidelines or using these tools? Of course. Uh, just to sort of add to my uh, panelists' points, right, we live in this digitized business world and in the always-on connected world. And if I bring that focus to what we do in technology, it's all about cloud, it's about SaaS, it's about API driven, it's about decentralization, it's about consumerization of a lot of things. So what those things means to us is, is a new paradigm of doing things. And from an investor perspective, this is also an opportunity to start incentivize, I think that's the word, also guide your sort of invested companies to really do the right things. There's multiple reasons to that, right? One is, um, I think the report actually talked about that they surveyed a lot of executives, decision makers, and 93% of them basically said, if there's a more secure product, I'm more than willing to pay more than 20% more just to get a product that's secure. I think that says a lot. And we also, I think there's just a news article came out and there's billions of records just got breached through an IoT platform. And we used to talk about hundreds of records, thousands of records, millions of records. Now it's in the scale of billions of records. I think that's getting people's attention. And uh, since we're sitting here in Dali in China, I thought 
maybe I'll take this opportunity to share a meaning of a Chinese word. And the Chinese word is Weiji. It actually, it's the same word as crisis. So there's two parts to that word. One is danger, the other part is opportunity. And this is really, I would say, almost we have all these challenges that could be considered a crisis. We don't have enough people, we have all this new technology, but just like Michelle was saying, this is an opportunity. If you pull back, then you're gonna lose. If you actually face it, and this is really what Leadership 4.0 is all about. It's take you know, this opportunity and do something different. And from an investor perspective, uh, just like on their investment, I think there's two purposes, right? First, they want to look for ROIs. If you do security right, you have a much broader access to market. And it's already happening in the cloud. Do you have SOC you know, 2 compliance? Can you do FedRAMP? If you have those, a lot of customers will buy. If you don't, they would walk away. And if you think about in the world of security, this is also about protecting your investment. If you're an investor, you invest in a startup and they didn't think about security from the get-go, in the new world of API and, and design sort of with security from the get-go, you don't get a second chance. If you don't do it right, you don't get a second chance. That's about protection as well. It's not just the business, but it's your investment. Thank, thank you very much. I think there was a lot of information. <laughs> and I want to take the opportunity. I know we have a couple of journalists in the room. Um, if you want to ask a couple questions, I know I have a couple. I'm, I've been kind of taking notes as we've been going through. Um, but just show of hands, and David in the back can, can help. Right up front. And just, intro just tell us what your news outlet is as well. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Eudora Wang. I'm a reporter from China Money Network based in Hong Kong. So I have a question for Mrs. Song. Uh, you mentioned about um, like why it is so important for those small startup companies to have a cybersecurity solutions. Uh, I'm wondering in the Chinese market, what do you think for those startups operating and developing in the Chinese market, like how much how many of them are actually using the cybersecurity and how much of them are still ignoring it? Um, I probably don't have all the stats, but I would say definitely uh, China in many ways has been in the f uh, forefront of cybersecurity. Uh, I go to the DEF CON, which is the hackers conference that happens in uh, Vegas every year, and more and more I see the teams from China presenting and competing. Uh, so I think that awareness is absolutely there. And I think a lot of companies, especially when they try to provide their services or product globally, uh, they need to provide that assurance that they take care of security, they take, take care of privacy. So I think more and more of them will do that. I uh, don't have the stats I'll at hand. I, I can, uh, I can um, add it up, anecdotally add on. So when we started Cloudflare, um, when we used to you know, track who was signing up for the service, uh, originally, our largest market was from the United States, small businesses. Our second largest market were Chinese companies that were signing up for Cloudflare. And that was early on, no one knew us. I mean, literally, this is eight people in a room in San Francisco, on the, uh, you know, at Third and Townsend. And we had launched, there was no ma media cover, no marketing dollars, it was just, we had built this service. And, and somehow, these small businesses across the world were our second biggest market. And so I think that says a lot to the number of small businesses there are around the world. I think they're the lifeblood of a lot of economies. And again, the lack of solutions. And when there was a solution, again, there was great demand and they were like, we need this. And so, you know, and, and today it becomes, it is, continues to be a big market for us. And so I think anecdotally, it just, it, it, um, I just wanted to add on to That's what Ryan said. David, anything to add to that? Um, <clears throat> I think the, 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 the that idea comes from the concept of the, uh, the, the Chinese scrappy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you, you're, one thing you're studying when you understand the Chinese ecosystem, Chinese company likes to lean on the partners to take care of the non-essential, uh, or not essential for their core business, not their competitive advantage. Uh, they know they are terrible in cybersecurity, that's how they lean on uh, Cloudflare that fast. Uh, same things uh, is also happening in the hardware space. Uh, so it, it's uh, good to recognize that uh, 
the security is not, security can be obtained with uh, proper up cooperation. Um, not some hero hackers in-house who's going to do all of them. Thank you for your question. I think there was another question right in the middle. Hello, allow me to raise the question in Chinese. I'm from a China Development Network and the China NDRC. When we talk about cybersecurity, it is related to the cyberspace or virtual space. So talking about cybersecurity, it is like Keeping the word safe in the cyberspace like public security or the legal system in the real world, it is quite complex. For your report, when you refer to cybersecurity, how do you define it? Is it a methodology or its strategic guidance? Could you clarify on how do you define your report? Thank you. So the, the question for those who didn't have the headphones on is how do we describe cyber security? How do we define it? And then talk a little bit more about that in relation to the report. Who wants to jump in? Alice, give it yeah, a try? No, start us off. I, I think we're not going to make much progress if we have an intellectual debate about definitions. Mm. I, I think um, in, in this discussion, I sort of like to go back to a picture of drinking water. You know, 200 years ago, it was very dangerous to drink water. And, you know, millions of people uh, got killed by drinking water. And then sort of about 150 years ago, society started to realize they have to do something about it. And it was actually a multi-stakeholder effort to make sure that nowadays we can open a tab and what comes out is mostly safe drinking water. We had urban planners who were designing cities so that actually we had pipes for safe water and for unsafe water. Um, we had chemists and pharmacists who were thinking about what do we need to do uh, actually to prevent people from getting ill from water. And, and actually we had to also educate people you know, what you need to do when you're not sure about uh, the, the safe drinking water. And so for me, actually, the conversation we're having is very much sort of like 150 years later, how do we make sure what comes out of the plug there or out of the air, uh, you know, is as clean and as safe as the drinking water? Now, you made an interesting point with regards to laws, and I think Let's acknowledge for a moment that lawmakers will not be fast enough to keep up with technological uh, developments and change. And I think what, what we try to accomplish with this is that a industry community in that, sea, in that moment is the investors sort of develop like their own rules or develop their own principles uh, in, in order to create a more and safer in environment. And I think that's really at the heart of the uh, efforts of the World Economic Forum. And this report or this initiative is one of those examples where we'd like to make a contribution to a, a safer cyberspace. I was going to add, I think um, the other, uh, I see a lot of the value that's uh, being encapsulated in the report is also just provide a unique angle to think about as an investor what you should be doing. You know, to in, we know investors, especially come from Silicon Valley, they're the ones who really provide a lot of the fuel for innovation. And we're basically saying from the investor perspective, how do we help them and incentivize all those innovations and incentivize people to do security by design and not doing afterthoughts. I think it's not particular to either network security or endpoint security, it's just about cybersecurity in general. David, any additional points to add? 
No, I think mm -hmm. some panelists did yeah. a terrific job. I love the drinking water analogy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm it's definitely going to use that again. It's very clear. Yeah, good multi-stakeholder example. Yeah. yeah, it's very good. Yeah. And a history lesson, too. Yeah. Right? Everyone wins. Um, oh, we do have another question in the front row. It's more of a suggestion. Please. Is that um, in the uh, startup community, if you could isolate certain checkpoints, because it's very difficult to reach all this, you know, hundreds of thousands of startups around the world. But I think if you could work, you know, because most of these startups will be, uh, as you said, will be consumer-based, app-based um, startups. So if you could work with Apple for on the Apple Store, and you could work on the marketplace with Google to enforce security before they are um, being able to publish them on, on these platforms, then you have a gateway where everything is get channeled because for these startup to get uh, access to consumers, they will have to go and be approved by, by Apple and by this. So working at these gateways, I think, would enforce because they will have no ability to launch if they don't get, get past that checkpoint. So now what you are doing, you are doing a containment. So, you know, we need work at the grassroots with the investors, with the startups, but that's gonna take time to, to you know, mm. to trickle down. But I think until we get there, maybe as well, equally, we need to work with the people who allow the startup to publish these applications online. I don't know if that is mm. something that you're thinking about. Maybe I can quickly react to this. This is not something we're currently looking at. However, what you touch on is um, how can we create incentives in the market that uh, you know, the market starts to think and act responsibly when it comes to cybersecurity. And th there's another area we're working on actually with insurance companies. Mm -hmm. uh, because when uh, you want an insurance either for um, you know, a cyber insurance or you want a sort of insurance for any business continuity insurance, if, if you wish, mm. if insurance companies start to, you know, uh, explain what they expect either to make sure that you, you, you qualify for an insurance or if you do this and that, your premium will go down or if you don't do this, your premium goes up. Um, I think that's another mechanism also to drive such behavior. I'll just, I'll, I can just add, um, you know, I think that if you, today, and it has been for the last, you know, many years, decade, and today, cybersecurity is really top of mind for a lot of folks because of what we just talked about. And again, it impacts every single business, small and large, every government, every nonprofit, and citizens around the world, okay? I think the question is to ask ourselves, where are we gonna be seven years from now? When, where are we gonna be 10 years from now? And my point of view is we're gonna be in a much better place. Mm -hmm because of exactly what you said. I think that their security is gonna get much built into the products. There's gonna be much more intrinsic product security. So you can get to the point where the water coming out of the glass is safe to drink. Uh, and then you're gonna have large companies, whether it's Cloudflare or you know, um, you know, Google Cloud or whatnot, where they have security built into their services, Splunk. And, and together, I actually think we're gonna be in a much better place seven to 10 years from now. And so the question is, how do you get from where we are to there? Um, but I think that that is the future. And that's why at the end of the day, I think, think I'm optimistic for the future if we can get through the next couple of years. Right. Yeah, so I think, I think this brings up also a very interesting point about some of the, the opportunities that fourth industrial revolution technologies provide is that there are all these ways to shortcut and actually leapfrog the processes. And I think um, one, one kind of final question I'd like to pose to each of you and give you a moment to make a final comment is, you know, another aspect of the 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution, is um, how quickly things are evolving and, and changing and how sometimes it's, it's hard for people and companies to keep up especially in the world of cybersecurity, there's all these advances and companies are you know, doing all these different things. Um, maybe for your closing thoughts, you could kind of sum up with how can people keep up and you know, actually take advantage and help shape you know, the trajectory of the fourth industrial revolution? Who wants to start off? 
It's a big question. We ask the big questions here wow. in Dalian. I mean, I'm happy to start, and <laughs> I, I will not answer too lengthy, but uh, I mean, I think that you're exactly right. We are in a moment of change, and this is not going away. And so the leadership that of tomorrow is that you have to embrace the change. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's not just enough to cope with the change, you have to bring it about yourself. And those are the best leaders. And that, that, I, mean, I think that's really the definition to me for leadership 4.0 is, it's not just coping with the change going on, it's like, how do I drive this within my organization or within my society? And, and the leaders that can do that will be the most successful. And I think that's really um, in an important kind of reflection for all the leaders here around the world to say, okay, am I just, it's not going away, am I coping with it or am I really just gonna embrace this? And the second thing I will say, which, I, which is really important is humans, if you have a high rate of learning, you can learn, right? And it's, and it's, you know, you can learn really quickly. There's so many materials online. You're not an expert in cybersecurity. It's not that hard. You learn the basics, and all of a sudden you know more. You start to have a conversation, you knew more. Okay, um, some, of the, some of the other things that are shaping other industries. Just start to learn, surround yourself with smart people, and all of a sudden a year later you know a lot more than you did the year before. And I think humans are incredibly resilient and have, uh, if you have a high rate of learning, very curious individuals, you'll weather this as a leader very well. David, final thoughts. Um, I think this is a, a really great start to highlight the, uh, the question, especially when we get into the 4IR. We are going to experience thousands of different sensors around us passing data. Uh, one thing, though, is the, I think uh, after 20 years of internet, 30 years of internet, uh, moving fast and break things is not, should not be the operating principle we have. Uh, the, the, I mean, for 30 years we worry about legislation is going to uh, slow down that innovation. Uh, but now we are cleaning up the mess, probably take another 30 years. Uh, so we should do, we should try to do the, whoops, sorry, we should do, try to do the, uh, this connected device right. Uh, do not resist to legislation. That's the that's a process. Uh, with the with the the government be able to come up with a standard, especially with the facilitation of World Economic Forum, having a global standard. Now everybody is coming out with the IoT standard. California is coming up with it. China is defining it, and we should bring that up to the table, not to use the same excuse we used 30 years ago. Is the you are going to slow us down. Let us move fast and break things. Mm -hmm. We are still living with that consequence today. Mm -hmm. So we should get it right this time. Four, four IR conversation, one IR chair. So <laughs> we're still working on some stuff. Um, Hyun, can you give us your final thoughts? Sure, I, I think um, digital is sort of the key word when we think about four IR. So coming from where I come from, I would say, really think about data as the foundational elements of what you do get going into the future. And whether it's security strategy, it's business intelligence, it's even automation, it, or a, AI as the new buzzwords, it all starts with the right data foundation. Alois? Well, let me close with the following thought. I think this is a very typical topic for the forum's multi-stakeholder approach. Um, it is one of those challenges that we have as a world that cannot be solved by governments alone. It cannot be solved by the private sector alone. It also requires the support and the, 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 the creativity of universities, not only the university as at the upper end, ac actually primary schools, even kindergarten. So the whole education system needs to play a role here. And last but not least, I think uh, individuals hopefully would inspiration from uh, different parts, be it private sector uh, inspiration or also in schools, will have to sort of uh, react to what's going on around them. So really I think it's, a, it's one of those challenges that probably together we're gonna solve in a, uh, in a, in a matter of years. It's not gonna be a fast uh, um, solution, but um, I, I share um, Michelle's view that um, in, in, in five to 10 years, we're gonna be in a much better place.
Well, that was a much better way to end than what I had written down on my notebook. So Alois will be doing all the press conferences next year. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you for your thoughts and insights. Thank you to our journalists in the room asking the questions. And thank you for those on live stream. Um, signing off, this is the last press conference from the annual meeting of the new champions 2019. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're great. I'm sorry for the phone. <laughs>